He's back, Justin. I was like, Justin, let's do a selfie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, he knows a thing or two about selfies. I mean, he's that is pretty good know, at them. He's pretty good at streaming them twenty four seven. It turns out, and turning that into a multi billion dollar company. It's good to see you all. Thanks yeah. for coming out. Well, Dylan, I thought it'd be fun to you know sort of first start off with a fun personal story, okay. which is how you and I first met. Oh yeah. Um, I think it also you know explains a bit about how uh, you know sort of long relationships can be in Silicon Valley. Um, this uh, story comes from an eleven and a half years ago when we were both you know sort of young bucks. Um, uh, Dylan, yeah, was, we're we're just ancient now, right? We're ancient. We're yeah yeah you know uh, heading towards our graves already. Um, so uh, Dylan uh, was a Teal Fellow uh, at the time, and I was applying for the uh, Teal Fellowship. Um, and if you think I'm abrasive and you know, sort of like wearing hats like this now, let me tell you, 11 years ago, I was even less polished, uh, and especially on stage. Um, and so uh, part of the Teal Fellowship application was you had to go present on stage and talk about what you're working on. And I decided to start uh, my presentation with, uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Delian, uh, which is uh, nailed backwards. Uh, so you know, so funny trope about my name. Delian. Um, Nailed. Exactly. Uh, but then, you know, probably not the best move was uh, at the end of this presentation where you're trying to, you know, sort of convince Peter and crew that you're very legitimate, um, I decided to uh, end it by saying, nailed it, and then dropped the mic physically. Um, and uh, maybe not the perfect impression to give, uh, Dylan comes up to me right afterwards in the heat of, you know, me literally coming off stage and probably, you know, very nervous, but trying to project a lot of confidence. And Dylan I, comes I, up I, to I, me. I only saw confidence for what it's worth. <laughs> I saw no signs of him being nervous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so Dylan comes up to me, he's like, Delian, um, interesting presentation. Just so you know, because you're about to have a bunch of follow-up conversations with people from the Teal Fellowship, you should know that you came off as a huge fucking asshole hey, on stage. Hey, that's not exactly what I said. <laughs> I said, you came off as like a little bit of an asshole up there. <laughs> uh, clearly, clearly different memories of it. But anyways, it was uh, you know, sort of valuable feedback. And, and, maybe. and, and then afterwards, Delian's like, dude, you totally threw me off my game, man. <laughs> and then I felt like an asshole. <laughs> and uh, he got the fellowship anyway. It really didn't throw him off his game. He was just <laughs> fine. But I think it's a good lesson in uh, timely feedback. It's good to be direct, but maybe choose the timing of it wisely. Yeah? I think, uh, you know, criticize in, uh, you know, sort of private, praise in public. Yes. But also figure out when's the right time to uh, <laughs> criticize. Uh, but also speaks to, you know, 11 and a half years later, here we are, you know, sort of back on stage again. Um, you know, when I was thinking about, you know, sort of what to chat about, I feel like, you know, we come from two very different, you know, sort of worlds, um, you know, sort of software for, you know, sort of designers. I build, you know, sort of satellites. But I think one of the interesting, you know, sort of parallels, you know, sort of between our two stories is, you know, in satellite land, there really is no such thing as like an MVP. You can't like turn something on and like a quick, you know, sort of three, six month process. It took us basically two and a half years to launch our first satellite. And in software land, the prototypical approach back, especially when we were starting our first companies, was like the lean startup, iterate quickly, throw something out the door that is sort of like the rough, you know, sort of MVP. You guys took a very different, you know, sort of approach. You took the Figma approach, the Notion approach. There's a handful that have followed in your footsteps, but you really decided to focus inwards and build something that was not just the MVP, yep. but was super polished and ready to go and launch, you know, sort of once that was ready, rather than trying to do the small iterations along the way. Why did you do that when in Silicon Valley, especially in 2012, 13, 14, everything was move fast and break things, you know, you know, ship things to your customers on day one, do MVP, and you did basically the opposite, the very contrarian view. Yeah, for us uh, back then, you're right, first of all. It was all lean startup methodology. And I think the reason lean startup caught on is because it mostly works. Like, it is the right advice to launch something fast get an MVP out there, iterate in public. That's the right advice most of the time. For us, we quickly found out it would be the wrong advice. We uh, were testing. We, it wasn't like we were just sitting there building stuff with no feedback. I would go talk with designers, and they kind of would stare blankly at me and go, yeah, it's really impressive, the science experiment you've done <laughs> where you got something to work in the browser, but like, there's a lot of reasons I'm not going to use this. And I'm like, great, list them off. And it was a long list of things. And so 
I, uh, you know, brought that back to the team and we got to work and we started it August 2012 full time. Have been thinking about it since December 2011. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, December 2015 that we launched a closed beta that didn't even have multiplayer. Wasn't until October 2016 that we launched our GA where anyone could sign up with multiplayer. And not until summer 2017 that we started charging. I don't advise that path unless you have to take it. Uh, it really sucked. Um, but for us, it did create a moat. And with that moat, we then were set up to go and execute and go build. And uh, I'm really grateful to no longer be in that phase of the company. <laughs> I feel like at the time, you know, even just taking that amount of time to build on something, especially when there was like a competitive set that was starting to like eat up some of the like vacuum of attention, let's say, right? Absolutely. You obviously had like, you know, Photoshop was not explicitly designed for UI and interfaces, but obviously a lot of people were using it. You had Sketch at the time, which was really growing a very strong community. And I forget the exact timing, but at some point like Benchmark led like a meaningful round of the company. And so you had people that were like out there making a lot of noise and yet you still had this patience. And then obviously I'm sure most people in this audience have never even heard of Sketch at this point and you guys completely dominated like why do you think the contrarian approach worked even in a space where like there were other people thinking about it and working well, on it first of all let me say sketch is an amazing company i'm sure many people here know it use it uh i have a lot of respect for that team and i think that we've learned a lot of Ske lot from sketch sketches learned a lot from figma um but yeah I mean, it was pretty terrifying we saw fireworks get killed terrible move uh, any fireworks fans out there? <laughs> Several of us. Yes, thank you. Um, I was a fireworks fan. And uh, when we saw that fireworks was being killed by Adobe, we were like, this is a giant opportunity. Uh, the market was still small. That was the other kind of contrarian bet at the time, was that we believed the market for design software would increase a lot. And sometimes it's really helpful to start with a small market uh, and then be able to expand from there. But then we got to work, and it was taking a long time. And meanwhile, there was this app called Sketch. And I remember in our first deck, uh, for our seed deck, I had a competitor slide. Sketch was on it. And I referred to it as like, ah, it's some buggy software out of Europe, lifestyle business, whatever. I couldn't be more wrong, right? They were out there. They were fixing stuff in market. They were growing. They were actually building a community, capturing Mindshare. Uh, and fixing their bugs while they're at it, becoming a key part of the workflow. And it so happened that we had a paradigm shift with multiplayer, web, collaboration, and we were able to lean into that, and that helped us. But if we were to go head, head to head with Sketch and just go, oh, here's a product that we've thought deeply about, they have a product you're used to, that would have been a losing proposition. Um, and they, were to form, they are a formidable competitor. They obviously, you know, uh, uh, maybe didn't immediately react to the paradigm shift, you know, the way that you did. And obviously today, you know, in the you know, sort of startup ecosystem, we're going through another massive paradigm shift with the adoption of, you know, sort of AI tools. And I think some people would argue, where is the point of UI design when at this point, you know, somebody that's super non-technical can go in, throw something together, put together an MVP, and they just have the AI effectively sketch out, you know, sort of all the pixels. How do you guys think about like adopting, you know, sort of the Figma, you know, sort of strategy, product, and approach in this world where maybe as, you know, sort of fundamental of a paradigm shift as multiplayer and online was for you guys back in like 2014 through 16, what is the 2024 through 2026, you know, sort of Figma strategy, you know, sort of relate to this new AI paradigm shift? Yeah, this is the the question of the moment, not just for Figma, but for, I think, all software. The vantage point from Figma is that we need to both lower the floor and also raise the ceiling. So what do I mean by that? I mean that more people should be able to participate in the design process. That's the lowering the floor part. And also, we need to make it so that designers uh, are able to do the work um, and explore the possibilities that the best designers today can explore. And if we can do that effectively, if we can raise the ceiling for people, that's where I think we'll really shine. Now, it's also the really hard part, because right now, if you look at all the software out there, everyone's lowering the floor. Very few are raising the ceiling and making it so that people can unlock skills they did not have before. And I think about it as, uh, a huge opportunity for us. But I also think that over time, if we just zoom out, the amount of software in the world, it's going to, it already has been exponentially increasing. Remember the Andreessen software is eating the world thesis? 
Uh, it ate the world. It ate the world. It's, it's still eating the world. I mean, the amount of software is still exponentially increasing. It's going to exponentially increase even faster in the age of AI. And so what does that mean for design? Well, actually, I think that design becomes even more important. Design is the differentiator. In the sea of software that's so vast, if you don't have high craft, if you don't have great design, you don't stand out. Design is the reason you're going to win or the reason you'll lose. And so our job as toolmakers is to empower our customers to be able to really stand out, to explore the option space of possibilities, uh, and then really bring a high degree of craft to what they put forward. Yeah, it seems like you're seeing, you know, so that you know, sort of bifurcation in like the like coding space, where like there are certain AI coding tools that are explicitly, let's say, like cognition, trying to re fully replace the coder and lower the bar. But then it feels like there are people taking that, you know, sort of other approach of like, you know, sort of cursor, which is raising the bar. And your point is, you guys want to dominate basically both sides of it, where it's like you want to be both the cognition and the cursor equivalent on the design side. Yeah, I mean, I think even cursor is still lowering the floor in some ways, right? Like cursor's not where you're going to go yet. Maybe in the future, a brilliant team. Uh, but at this point, cursor is not the tool you'll use to figure out what should the perfect architecture of my software stack be. Uh, how should I go and create like the most amazing optimization uh, for you know my rocket ships that I'm building, right? Like you're not using cursor for that. Uh, but I think that if the other thing that's important is that design lets you translate across abstractions. And we think of the entire product building process with Figma and how we can go from brainstorming and ideation in FigJam to slides for alignment to design and Figma design to dev mode where you translate design into code and beyond. And how do we make it so we can support that entire process? And what's cool about AI is that it helps you translate across the abstractions. You can go from a FigJam file to a deck now in Figma. So how do you then go from design to code in a way that's consistent with your code base so you don't have to repeat yourself? That's the fundamental process of engine, fundamental principle of engineering is, is don't repeat yourself. You Did don't you want new code all the time. To zoom back maybe to the you know, sort of early days of uh, you know, sort of building uh, Figma, uh, both of us have relatively non-traditional backgrounds. You dropped out of Brown, I dropped out of MIT, you know, decided to you know, sort of go work on our first companies. Talk a little bit about that like Teal Fellowship community and how that you know, sort of helped you know, sort of, you know, give you a sense of grounding but also purpose and ambition in those early days where you know, now there's obviously a very strong, let's say, community of people that have dropped out and built startups at the time. It was effectively Zuckerberg was the you know, sort of only you know, sort of one. You had the social network come out, but it was still a relatively contrary. And, you know, of approach totally. you know, sort of back then. How do you feel like that community helps you know, sort of shape you know, who you are and you know, how Figma was built? So yeah, so I dropped out of Brown. Uh, I didn't know I dropped out at the time. I thought I was taking a break. <laughs> uh, that was a better pitch for my parents in case it's useful for anyone else here. Uh, and you know, I had this amazing community at Brown. I had all these friends. I had folks that I was spending time with. And I had done internships in Silicon Valley. I knew 30-year-olds in San Francisco. Uh, and I also knew my friends back home because I grew up in Northern California. Uh, and my friends back home were like going to community college, trying to figure out, you know, what's next? Should I work retail? Should I try to be in a more of a career track? And then I had the 30-year-old the friends and they're on a totally different life track. Oh man, should I have a baby? And, and it's like, okay, where do I fit into all this? <laughs> and uh, took the Teal Fellowship, thought it was going to be 100K over two years. Amazing. Like that, that lets you support yourself and really run for it. Um, what I found out was actually the benefit was two other things that were way more important. First, it was the social connections, the idea of being around people who were like me. Um, and that was so special and so important. And a lot of the Teal Fellows, uh, I know for me and I suspect for you as well, are some of my best friends still today from my class. The second one, which I never knew was coming, was they were pushing me and inspiring me to think bigger. It turns out there are so many startup ideas in the world. There's like all these inefficiencies in the market. The efficient market hypothesis is a complete lie. <laughs> and it's so easy to find some small random inefficiency and go, oh man, I can make some money there, right? For us, the first one we found was meme generation. And I was like, dude, 
to my co-founder, Evan, who's a like beyond brilliant guy, way smarter than pretty much anyone else I know. I'm like, memes to the moon. <laughs> yeah. 2012, 2013, memes are going exponential. We should make a meme generator. Okay, a week later, we finished our meme generator. It's not that hard to build a meme generator. And it was the best meme generator online. And we looked at ourselves and we're like, yeah, if we do this, like, Evan's like, I'm quitting. And I looked at myself in the <laughs> mirror. I'm like, I did not drop out of brown for this, right? But then you're, you're faced with this ex- existential despair. Like, what am I doing? What should I do next? And going to the Teal Fellowship community, talking to them. I remember one guy, Tom, Tom Courier, mm-hmm. he looked at me and he said, why are you doing this? You have two years. You have the freedom to go build anything you want to do in the world. Like, go do something meaningful. And conversations like that led to building Figma, probably led you to building Varda. And uh, it's, I think, really inspiring to be around a set of people that force you to think bigger. And if you don't have that set of people in your life yet, my uh, challenge to all of you would be to go find them, to go find the people that are going to force you to think bigger. Yeah, for you know, European founder that's in the audience today, that's the 20 to 25 year old that maybe recognizes from your talk, hey, I might not be around people that are pushing me to like, you know, sort of think bigger. What do you think is the sort of tactical feedback? How do they find that you know, sort of group of hyper, you know, sort of ambitious, you know, smart folks that are going to push them in that way? Uh, I mean, the internet is an amazing place. And if you can look at the local communities, whether it's at university or on forums online, I mean, social media, there's so many places out there to go find folks. And you can just reach out to them. The beautiful thing is like a cold email uh, can go quite a long way. You know, even when I was in school, I was reaching out to people and just emailing them saying, hey, can I, can I grab coffee with you? And some of the people I did that with, like, uh, you know, I'm still in touch with. Last night, I saw Cal, the co- former co-founder of Slack. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were catching up and he's someone I've known since I was a teenager uh, because he was kind enough to give me his time even though there was no reason for him to give me time. I had not done nothing at that point. And so I think do that, first of all. Um, and second of all, try to figure out your path, if you're wanting to be a founder, to give yourself time. Because that's the most precious resource, is to have the time to explore. Uh, if we said, we have six months, and in six months we'll make a call for Figma, do we continue or do we call it quits? We would have totally called it quits in six months. You need more time. And you need to not be so time bounded, and you need to run a lot of experiments. So we're, uh, you know, sort of here in Europe, and uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, about two years ago, you started spending a lot of time in, you know, sort of Europe, both in, uh, you know, sort of Brussels and London, mm-hmm. due to a certain acquisition, you know, sort of process. Yep. I remember um, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember you looking very jet lagged a bunch of times. I saw you, and I was like, poor Dylan. Um, so. What was that like? What did you learn about the world of the regulatory environment? What do you think you know, sort of regulators get right versus wrong? What would you do if you were in their shoes, now having learned what you've learned about what you went through, but also what's best for the capital markets? Oh, man, that's a big question. Um, well, the first thing I'd say is that it was weird because it was like uh, Delian's referring to, in case people don't know, we tried to sell Figma to Adobe. For $25 didn't, billion. Dollars. Uh, didn't work. Uh, still an independent company, thrilled to be an independent company. Uh, you know, as I told the Wall Street Journal on day one, I was like, we'll be fine either way. We are fine either way. Uh, but, I, you know, first of all, I was amazed that despite going through this really hard process, and it objectively was pretty much not going well the entire time, <laughs> uh, I fell in love with Brussels, London. Like, these are beautiful, incredible places with incredible people. So that was the first thing that surprised me was despite like the atmosphere psychologically, the physical atmosphere, the social atmosphere was wonderful. The second thing I'd say is that on the European regulator side, they're my favorite regulators for sure. Um, because they are human and they're direct. Uh, and I always knew where I stood with them. And I can't say the same for all the other regulators. <laughs> um, but what I will say is, it, you know, there's sort of the legal points of what does the law say? Um, I was pleased that I felt always in Europe that the rule of law followed. Um, you know, do I agree with the laws? N- maybe not, 
I think that um, uh, there's a lot of minority report going on in terms of future crime that is evaluated as part of the regulatory process in Europe that I think is kind of weird. Uh, but it's, in, it's there. It's uh, something that I think is um, followed and there's clear procedures about how to evaluate it. Now, what I think is important is that Europe has a bright future ahead of it if you're able to let industry run. And when I look at the future of Europe right now, and I project forward 10 years, and I look at industries, especially like the automobile industry, what do we want for automobile industry in Europe? Like the automobile industry in Europe, it should be a lot bigger in 10 years than it is today. I think we probably all agree on that. And I think right now, if you let uh, the regulation and the ideals be that are fueling the regulatory uh, regime in Europe uh, continue the way it is right now, it is explicitly anti-consolidation. And if you do not allow consolidation, you cannot have supply chains and you cannot have the scale that will allow you to compete with the Chinese. And China's Chinese cars, the cost of them will be so much less than the cars that are available across Europe. So you have a choice, Europe. You can either- Make Europe great again. Uh, you can either you know, <laughs> allow for some amount of consolidation and figure out how to amend your rules and get to the point where you can set up Europe for success for the next decade ahead, or you can lose key industries uh, to international players across the globe. And yeah, the choice is yours. Good luck. <laughs> we've seen this. Um, we've seen this tactically, obviously, you know, sort of play out across a couple of acquisitions. Even since we last had our prep call, obviously, there's the you know sort of famous case of iRobot. Obviously, you know, sort of post blocked acquisition not working out, but then Spirit Airlines. Spirit you know, Airlines, rest in peace. Um, obviously, you know, so you guys were, you know, sort of well off either, you know, sort of way, but obviously those two companies were not, you know, sort of nearly as fortunate. How do you think about some of that, you know, sort of, as you called it, the future crime stuff, but balancing that with, you know, ultimately the company's survivability ex ante the acquisition effectively? Yeah, it's just a really sad story for, especially Spirit most recently. Uh, this is more of a U.S. thing in some ways, but uh, for Spirit, you know, the, the goal of regulation here is to increase competition. And in this case, they went through an acquisition process and on the back end of it, they, they literally went bankrupt. So if you measure the results, it didn't increase competition, it, it decreased competition because like Spirit Airlines is gone, rest in peace. So clearly it's not working, um, at least not in all cases. Uh, we can argue about whether it's working in some cases, but when we have these very tangible results, it's like we've ran the experiment the current approach is not working. How do we adapt? And I think that that is a question that needs to be answered across Europe, across the UK, and across the United States. Uh, and all three bodies really need to introspect right now. I think you and I are both, you know, sort of somewhat rare in Silicon Valley, in that we, you know, sort of strongly sit in both the like founder and investor, you know, sort of world, and that. Um, we both have started companies. We've both also led, you know, sort of Series A's. To the founders that are out there, how do you think about advising them on like prioritizing people that look like us versus people that are, you know, sort of pure, you know, sort of financial investors and the pros and cons of basically, you know, sort of both approaches. We probably both have much less bandwidth, but we've also, you know, sort of can actually, you know, offer them tactical advice on what it's like to build a company. I think in general, um, what's important as you're looking for a first investor or for an nth investor as a founder is you need to start with what are the um, skills that I'm lacking? What are the areas I don't have as much insight on? And what can best complement me around the table? And then from there, I would build your list of people you want to talk with. I would then go and talk with them and spend time with them and actually build a relationship. There is a popular meme that you should only talk to investors when you're raising. And uh, I think that's probably true for the bad investors. Why spend time with bad investors if you don't have to? Uh, but for the investors that will actually be useful, and there are some, um, why would you not talk with them throughout to see if they're the ones that you want to spend 10, 20 years with? And then reference the heck out of them. Like for any investor you're considering bringing on, 
you need to call the founders they've backed that have worked out and also call the, invest the founders they've worked with that really haven't worked out. And uh, you know, for references, you also have to listen to the reference. This is a mistake I've made historically. Um, it's really easy when you're referencing to hear only what you want to hear. But you have to, like, I encourage you to write it all down and then read your notes to make sure you're not missing something. Do you have an example of an investor where you guys engaged with them you know, sort of deeply for an extended period of time, but then only much later on became an investor in Figna and actually ended up being like a huge impact to the you know, sort of company through their involvement? John Lilly, who wrote our Series A, is a great example of that. Uh, John Lilly turned us down in our seed round. He was at Greylock at the time. And uh, he said, hey, Dylan, I don't think you know what you're doing. He was right, by the way. <laughs> and uh, we kept in touch. He said, hey, I'm happy to be helpful. If you read Twitter, X, you'll know that's a meme too. People are like, oh yeah, when an investor says, how can I be helpful? That's code for good fucking luck. <laughs> uh, and in the case of John, the guy's a mensch. He, uh, he spent every month, we would hang out, he would make introductions, he'd give strategic advice, he would help. And uh, at some point he said, hey, I think, um, you know, if you ever think about a Series A, let me know. I'd like to talk to you about that. And I gave it a week and I called him up and I said, John, I think we're, we're going to go raise our Series A now. And I did talk to, you know, someone else as well. Uh, but honestly, I just wanted to work with John. And he's still on our board today and just an incredible, incredible supporter and mentor for the company. So I think, in summary, build long relationships with investors, build long relationships with potential employees too. Some of the folks that we tried to recruit long ago, you know, even eight, nine years ago, they're now showing up today and saying, hey, I'm ready to join Figma. And some of those meetings where you walk out and go, oh man, was that a waste of an hour? They're never gonna convert. You'll be surprised in the longevity of your company, how much it can matter. Well, Take the long view. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your story today. It was Dalian, really great. Thank Thanks you. so much, everyone. Thanks all.